Are we the same? Sometimes the thing that keeps us from thinking we're the same is stigma. Stigma is this taint, it's this flaw, it's this thing that we use to mark people as different, as other, as subhuman. My ancestor, Marie Therese Coincoin, was a woman from Togo in West Africa who was forcibly brought to the United States and enslaved in Louisiana in the mid-1700s. She was stigmatized as subhuman because she was black. Many African enslaved people at that time were experimented on with medical procedures without anesthesia and definitely without consent. Despite these atrocities, they kept their eyes toward freedom. They fought and rejected the stigma of being, as being treated as subhuman. So they could, they could create a generation, an opportunity for generations to come. Marie Therese Coincoin taught her children that they were the same as everyone else, that they could be equally successful. They inherited 300 acres of land and created a society of free people of color in Cane River, Louisiana. They built one of the first Catholic churches for free people of color in the United States, St. Augustine. My grandmothers, both from Louisiana, were able to get graduate degrees in education in a time when many people weren't even graduating from high school. But I also remember family members whose limbs were amputated from diabetes, who died from cancer, heart disease, dementia, all because they couldn't afford adequate health care and they didn't trust the medical system. Their sacrifices inspired me to go get an education, get a PhD in sociology, and go back to my community and help. That's why I'm here today talking to you about HIV Cure Research Day. HIV Cure Research Day is designated as December 14th. It is this prospective space, this, this opportunity for us to think about how we can right the wrongs of the past and before there is a widespread cure, be able to involve community members in the process of thinking about how we do clinical trials, how do we fight against the stigma around HIV? How do we increase access to healthcare? How do we mobilize community members to be a part of that process to promote equity? See, I was born in 1985. It was a time when people were just finding out about HIV. We didn't know if there was a treatment, let alone a cure. It was community members who mobilized to push the government and scientists to conduct research to develop treatments. Today, we actually have the tools to end the epidemic. We have PrEP, which is an HIV prevention pill people can take daily to prevent HIV up to 99% with perfect use. It's kind of like birth control for HIV. Uh, earlier th this month, even, the government announced that they were going to provide PrEP for free for people. We also have had two people cured of HIV, including Timothy Ray Brown, who has been in remission for the past 12 years and celebrates his 13th year on February 7th. And we also have the London patient, who is a man who's been in remission for the past year. Um, and we call him the London patient because he's a research participant and we want to protect his identity. I'm sure you all are thinking the same thing that most people ask me when I tell people that there's been two people cured of HIV. Why isn't there a cure for everyone? There's 37 million people in the world living with HIV, and only two people have been cured. Why is that? Well, the answer is complicated. Both Timothy Ray Brown and the London patient have cancer and HIV at the same time. They both underwent chemotherapy, and received a bone marrow transplant from a donor 
who had a natural genetic mutation that was naturally resistant to HIV. Their experiences were risky at best, painful, expensive. If anybody has known any family members who've gone through chemotherapy, you know that that can be a very arduous process. And so it's difficult to think about doing that for 37 million people. So scientists now are conducting clinical trials to try to replicate that process in a way that's less invasive um, and has less side effects for people. But these medical advancements would not have been done without people of color. For example, Henrietta Lacks was a black woman in, in the 1950s living in Baltimore who had cervical cancer. She went to Johns Hopkins University and thought, OK, I'm going to Johns Hopkins. I'm going to try to get the best medical treatment I possibly can. Instead, she was stigmatized as being black and low income and a woman. They assumed that she didn't understand medical treatment. And they didn't bother to ask her consent to get a biopsy of her cancer cells for future research. Her cancer cells became the source of the HeLa cell line, which has generated treatments for almost every health condition you can imagine, including cancer, HIV, the polio vaccine, and even zero gravity in outer space. I have no idea how that one works, but it does. <laughs> so the irony is that she ended up dying from cervical cancer. And Johns Hopkins got billions of dollars in research. They did get some, some consequences, of course, for those actions, but it didn't it pales in comparison to what the impact was for her, her family, and African-American communities in Baltimore and across the country. Many people know about that story. It's very real and very forefront in people's memories. In addition to this stigma, there's also an issue with access, access to health care. For example, just two years ago, I was sitting with a man named Ladarius, who is a veteran. He had been living with HIV for the past two years untreated. He went to the veteran's hospital, and they diagnosed him, and they said, you need to get on treatment. But they let him leave without getting on medication. He was stigmatized as having HIV and for having HIV, and didn't, and was afraid to get on medication. He found out about the work that I and my colleagues were doing around HIV cure research on social media, reached out to us to ask for help. We, of course, wanted to help immediately, and I called some of my friends at the clinic to help get him an appointment, and then uh, we realized that he didn't have transportation. So then I had to make sure that we got him a car or get, got him transportation to the clinic. Finally, after that, we got him to the clinic. You know, he was, if you can only imagine, extremely scared. But when he finally got there, they said, well, you don't have the necessary paperwork. You need proof of income. You need proof of residency. You need to show, uh, you need to fill out this application for medication assistance program before you can even see the doctor. Of course, he didn't have any of that. That's, it's, it's like going to the DMV and waiting in line for hours, and then you finally get to the kiosk, and they're like, yeah, you don't have the right stuff. <laughs> I mean, that's so frustrating. And I took it for granted as someone who was employed and had medical insurance that he could easily go to the clinic and get an appointment and be seen by a doctor, just like all of us can. And we realized that his experience was not unique. Again, there's 37 million people in the world living with HIV, and only 40% of them are on medication. This, this issue around access is also an issue for medical providers and case managers. They're using a pen and paper process. They literally fill out, they print it out, they fill out the application by hand, 
for people to get access to programs to pay for HIV medication. Remember I told y'all that the government approved the prevention pill. Is this gonna be the same process? Pen and paper, right? So we decided to do something differently. We developed this app called Digital Links. Digital Links automates this process by pre-screening people's eligibility for programs that pay for their medication. Someone would just create a profile, they'd answer short demographic questions, we'd be able to use those answers to match them to the eligibility criteria and fill out the applications and people can upload any necessary documents, take screenshots, whatever, and send it to the medical provider before they even get to the appointment. This is one tool in the toolbox that we can use toward ending the epidemic, but we have so much more to do. This issue around access, of course we have, it's great that we have technology and healthcare, but there's an issue around access, and it's all too true in the research triangle area of North Carolina. There's billions of dollars in research money, there's universities, Durham is designated as the city of medicine but Durham was also ranked as the ninth highest city in the country for AIDS-related death. There's a disconnect between the resources and the people who need them. So we decided to do something differently. We had to use community and work with community members and mobilize them in order to do something differently. For example, my co-founder for HIV Cure Research Day is Kimberly Knight. I met Kimberly Knight on December 14th at one of the first community events I hosted, which was a hip hop concert around conspiracy theories for HIV Cure. So if anybody knows anything about hip hop, it's the perfect venue to talk about conspiracy theories. <laughs> so Kimberly became passionate about fighting HIV, the HIV epidemic, and raising awareness about it because her husband died from complications with AIDS. She didn't find out that he had HIV until he was on his deathbed. The stigma around him being diagnosed kept him from taking medication. He was afraid people were gonna find out. She had to forgive him in that moment, and she vowed to help as many people as possible, especially black men, get onto medication. To date, she has helped over 100 black men get on medication. including Ladarius. Ladarius now has an undetectable viral load, which means that he will not pass on HIV to his partner, and he is living a long and healthy life. He's working as a full-time artist. It's, it's the stories like these, these experiences from community members that matter, that create solutions that are relevant and, and help solve some of the problems of access for community. With, with Kimberly Knight and other community organizations, we have been able to host statewide contests where we get community-based ideas on how to use technology, how to work with government and universities and medical systems, cure scientists across the world, We've worked with colleagues in South Africa, in China, in Europe. We've worked with the Office of Public Engagement and the Office of the Governor to pull people together from all walks of life to be able to come up with solutions that work on the ground. And thinking about what people of color in particular need and those from marginalized communities need to increase that access. Like many of you in the audience, they don't know a lot about the science around curing HIV. But what we all have in common is that we care about our loved ones. 
We care about affordable health care. We care about access to medication and cutting edge medication. So I challenge you, let's learn from the past so we can create a new future our ancestors would be proud of. Because in the end, we are all the same.